So welcome to the UNCG Libraries UNCG online collaboration where we're going to talk about um, an introduction to OER, which is Open Educational Resources at UNCG, um, with examples. I'm going to show an example of a class I work with in kinesiology. And then Miranda, is, um, who is a, a senior instructional designer at UNCG online, is going to talk about some work that she has done working with um, HDF, uh, Human and Development Family Studies, right, um, with uh, a, a class that incorporated OER materials. So welcome. Um, so here is a link to this presentation if you want to follow along. Um, and of course, let me grab it and throw it in the chat. Okay, so here we go. So I'm Sam Harlow, I'm the online learning librarian and I took over OER for UNCG libraries with my colleague, Melody Root, the student success librarian in fall um, 2019. Wow, it seems like it was a while ago, but really it was just a short time, a short time ago. Um, so uh, that is what I work with a lot of online courses. I help um, our great library liaisons with online learning at UNCG, um, but I also do OER now, um, like I said, with my colleague Melody. Hi everyone, I'm Miranda Lim. Sam kind of already gave my bio, it's pretty brief. I'm a senior instructional designer with UNCG Online, the Division of Online Learning. So in the before times, before COVID, you may have been to our offices off Northridge Street, we're off campus, um, but I have worked with UNCG Online for the last six years. Um, and it's been great. So um, what I'll talk to you about a little bit later is an OER project that I did with, as Sam said, the HDF SES team. Great. So I told Miranda this and some people at the beginning. So I'm going to turn my camera off while I present the next part. Um, not because of anything <laughs> crazy, but because I have a three year old in the background, as well as um, a almost six year old coming home um, with her dad in a little bit. Um, so I just uh, didn't want a lot of distractions going on. But if you hear background noise, that is what is going on. It's it's my daughter and her dad entering. So. So the first thing I want to talk about is that um, is just to give the background of why open education, why use open educational resources. So open educational resources are free to use materials that we typically talk about to replace uh, co costly course materials, which typically are textbooks. Um, so they're not just free stuff that are online, they are open to be adapted and reused um, to be truly OER. And we're going to talk about um, what that means and go into definitions. But these are some images that we like to use when we talk about OER and we introduce it um, to different audiences, depending on what you're, and you maybe have seen this before if you've been to other stuff about OER. Um, but the first image over here about the person, sorry, is a graph where it's about the percent change since 1978 for educational books, medical services, new home prices, and um, CPI, so the Consumer Price Index. So um, it starts from 1978, uh, you know, down there, and you can see everything has risen, right, inflation, all that stuff, um, but the biggest um, line is that textbook cost has come up, educational books have gone up 812% uh, since 1978 which is significantly higher than medical services, new home prices, and the, and the consumer price index overall. Um, and the other image over here is a little cartoon where you have a student coming back with a huge, um, you know, kind of backpack on his back, on their back, and the parents are saying, move back home. Kids today are so lazy and irresponsible. Your mother and I started out with nothing, and the student is saying, trust me, I would have loved started out with nothing, because um, the figure on, his, on their back is representing this five-figure student loan debt, uh, which is pretty uh, typical of the student loan debt of many of our students in particular here at UNCG. And here's a quote from a library student assistant from I think about three years ago, um, where they told us that they had stopped buying textbooks their second semester here. So, um, you know, hopefully that kind of shows you why, but now we're going to talk about what are they in detail and where can you find them for your courses uh, just to kind of get started. So again, I mentioned this OER materials are not just like free stuff that you find online, right? The minute you create something that is tangible that includes a website or anything you put online, it actually does have copyright. Um, so to be OER, to be open, it has to state somewhere that it is 
it is getting rid of copyright because truly OER materials should be able to be retained, reused, revised, remixed, and redistributed. Meaning that if you find an OER textbook, website, um, modules online, that means you can take them into your course and change them however you see fit as long as you are citing the original author as a source of inspiration. So um, OER, um, you know, sometimes people think of it as just textbook replacement. So thinking about it in a purely textbook sense of the sense of the word, but it's really anything online that's to do with course materials, which of course could be assignments, simulations, learning objects, labs, syllabi, um, modules of content, journal articles um, are typically not OER, they're typically um, open access, which we can talk about the difference in a little bit if y'all have questions, um, but this is really mostly about OER, but um, video library, software, calculators, and analytics, right? Anything that's related to these course materials um, that you're not typically going through, again, a publisher, um, that's why, again, I would consider journal articles more open access. So we have a guide on this at UNCG that Melody and I have, um, you know, taken and adapted based on what we've had in the past, make sure it's updated. Uh, so um, I'm going to throw this in the chat and then I'm going to go out to it real fast as well. So there it is if you want to explore it, because this really goes over um, most of the stuff that you would need to know about in terms of OER at UNCG. So I'm going to talk about the OER mini grants in a little bit where we offer these $1,000 mini grants to encourage instructors to use low cost or free alternatives to expensive course materials. But note that we do have materials on here to learn more about the basics of OER, which is really what I'm going over here for educators, as well as a page on OER for learners, where we have videos if you want to have your students work with OER, um, as well as OER searching, which links to these major repositories. Um, so if you're looking for OER materials, if you want to play around with these repositories, these are a lot of the big ones that we typically use and recommend to people to get started. Um, so, um, of course, you do have a library liaison. I think some of them are here in this webinar. Um, so you're welcome to in the chat say uh, what your department is and I can make sure that you are connected. But your library liaison as well as Melody and myself can help you with this if you're like, oh, I have no idea where to get started. Um, but a good place to go, you could always just pick one of them, maybe one that your colleague has recommended. Um, but a really big one for, you know, a lot of different topics is OpenStax. So you can go here to OpenStax, go down to subject, and note they have all these different subjects. So you could go down into social sciences, right? And then see what they have. So let's say you want this psychology one. Here we go. And note that they are very pretty big books because they're online, they're freely available. They have these open licenses on them. Uh, so you can go to the table of contents and link to individual chapters. And remember, if it's not exactly how you would teach it or incorporate it in a class, you can adapt it. OpenStax is also available within Canvas Commons, which is the repository within Canvas, where you can pull these down into modules. If you create a free account through OpenStax, which is totally fine um, to do with your UNCG account, it also provides you with ancillary materials where you can help create quizzes, um, you know, uh, presentations for classes and more. Um, so again, this is just one example out of many uh, that we like to do and see they have this nice adaptive website, very accessible. They also make their, um, one thing I like about OpenStax as well, is that they make their licenses really easy to understand. So if you wanted to cite this, you just scroll down and go to citation, attribution, and then here we are, um, and then uh, you, it tells you what you can do with it exactly um, and the actual information that you would need to build a citation to let people know where you got it from and when it was last updated. So again, just one example out of many. Um, another thing I wanted to point out on this guide really quickly is that um, we also have this great OER by subject part that we are working on um, consistently um, with a great librarian named Michelle Courtney who um, helps us add stuff to this guide. So as we find out about something like maybe an instructor at UNCG um, or maybe we hear about the listserv says, oh, I found this really great OER resource for um, let's go to biology, then we will add it to here um, in a more subject specific way. So this is also a really good place to get started on your, um, to find OERs for your discipline. Um, so if you were a biology teacher trying to teach with biology, this gives you again, these pretty large 
um, open text to do with um, biology. Um, so liaisons help with this, um, Michelle adds to this, and then again, Melody and I um, send stuff to Michelle as well. Um, so we're adding to it all the time. So also if you see stuff missing in your own searching, uh, feel free to email me. We would love to get, we're, we're adding to this again weekly. Okay. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about before um, we kind of go into specific examples are the textbook affordability mini grants, also um, referred to as uh, OER mini grants. So we've offered these, I think since 2014 here at UNCG, and we are excited to announce that even with all the stuff going on, we will be offering it again in spring 2021. Um, so all you need to give us in the application that actually is available right now, if you wanted to work on it over winter break is the number of students, your current textbook, or something that costs your students money in your class, um, and then how you plan to eliminate that or reduce it. So you um, could replace it with something that costs money as long as it is something that costs less money than the original textbook. Um, so you need to put us the plan in there, the challenges you think that might arise, and your assessment plan. Um, we also heavily recommend that you uh, contact and work with your librarian um, just to make sure you're on the right, right track, but it is not required. Um, it's just heavily recommended. So again, if you don't know who your librarian is, um, let me know in the chat and I'll let you know. So some common questions we do get about this, just to kind of cover a couple, and then we'll go to the website so you can kind of see um, other stuff related to it, is... Um, what if I am not currently using a textbook, but I still want to apply for this grant? Um, that's okay. We can't always accept everyone, right? Um, we can typically give around 10-ish per year. Um, so always apply and just note that even if you don't get it, like try again another year. Um, but we do take in mind um, saving of students. So if you tell us, you know, like, oh, I don't really have a textbook for the course, um, already, then we might give it to someone who is like eliminating a costly textbook um, completely. Another thing to keep in mind is that if, if, if you have like eliminated a textbook last year, right, based on COVID, you can backdate that, right? Like you could say in the application, like the textbook that was generally used before I changed it or before my department changed it was $185. Um, and, you know, again, the way we've taught it since fall 2020 has been zero cost. So you can like backdate it or find a textbook that is generally used for that. Uh, just let us know um, in the um, plan for the projects like that you're kind of backdating it in that way. And we particularly are, are really trying to be sensitive to that in the time of COVID, knowing that a lot of y'all, a lot of instructors have made um, a lot of great changes, um, moved online quickly and reduced costs for students. So it's okay to backdate it and for you to get rewarded in that way. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, so another question that we commonly get is, do you have to be a uh, faculty member with the department, you know, like a tenure track faculty member? No, you only have to be the instructor of record. So, um, you know, graduate students can apply if they're an instructor of record for a course and they're eliminating a textbook. Um, we really actually encourage that as well. Um, so let me know if you have other questions. Uh, we will be running um, a series of workshops, virtual workshops this year um, in February. So if you go out to this uh, website, which if you're like um, me, uh, maybe you also like sometimes can just remember Go Links. <laughs> I have so many go links. Uh, here's the website if you want to check it out. Um, but we do have the current dates um, up. So uh, keep that in mind. So you are here. Uh, we did have an open pedagogy and EDI uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion webinar yesterday by my um, colleague, Melody Rude. Today you're here. Um, and then we have some other stuff again that we've already gone over tutorials and guides. And I'll go over the tutorials in a second but also about this OER mini grants. Um, so with the dates, the sessions or the workshops are these dates. And then um, here's the deadline, which is March 12th. If you need longer or if you have questions, um, definitely let me know. We can be kind of flexible. Um, and you, if you are selected, we'll let you know in early April, but you don't get the study. This, this is for the 2021-2022 academic school year. Uh, so keep that in mind as well for that. 
Um, and then if you want to learn more, um, again, a lot of the stuff we already covered, but we also have this set of OER tutorials that if you do get selected for the grant, we will have you um, do them um, just to make sure you kind of get the basics of OER, but it's on finding OER, creating OER, and teaching with OER. Um, and the teaching one includes um, the EDI social justice component of uh, using OER as well. Um, and they do produce certificates of completion through the website platform. Uh, so again, if you get selected, you'll have to do those this year. It's a new addition. But then um, we also have a why OER and we also have past grant winners. So if um, you wanted to look for a colleague who's done it to ask them what their experience was, how they felt about it, um, anything like that, you're welcome to go on here and see who has won it um, in the past. I know I'm kind of hitting up in my time. I want to have Miranda to have plenty of time. Um, so just some quotes about um, students that are appreciative of getting rid of a textbook um, through these grants or just through um, teachers deciding to use OER. I truly appreciated the resources over a traditional textbook. I connected more with the resources and it was less expensive. Um, I appreciate the fact that I didn't have to spend money on a textbook um, and then more and more and more. Um, so faculty typically like it as well. Um, we very rarely had a faculty member say, I want to go back to the traditional textbook, though it does once in a blue moon happen. Um, the resources I found are better than the textbook. When I told my class there would be no required textbook, they all clapped and cheered. Um, so here's a little um, infographic on um, OER and COVID. Um, so um, just in that OER is really here to help with all the complications that come with having to convert to courses online, as well as the struggles that our students are going through, right? Um, students are um, going to be strapped, are already strapped for that textbook money, and I think they're just going to be more and more, right? Because OERs, they don't have an access code, there's no expiration date, and they're completely free for our students. Um, and then it also gives you all these other great things like OERs are typically always online. A lot of times they're already accessible. So you don't really have to worry about that in terms of your courses. Um, and then, um, you know, you don't have to worry about copyright and having to go to all, like learn all about copyright and what you can put online because if you use truly OER stuff, it just kind of gets around that. Okay, so we're going to talk, Miranda's going to take over, but just quickly before she does, I did want to show you um, a collaboration between me and an instructor, uh, Deanne Brooks. I don't know if you're here, Deanne. If you are, feel free to unmute and talk about this. Um, but uh, this is the course. It was a Kinesiology 286 course, Foundations of Sports Coaching, which was actually cross-listed with, I think, an entrepreneurship class in the Bryan School, um, where they did have a traditional textbook. Um, one of the main limitations of it beyond the cost um, was in terms of representation. They didn't have as many um, female identifying sports coaches in there. So um, not only did Deanne make her course OER, where she eliminated a textbook, she um, had permalinks to articles, which though not OE, fully OER, right, because like these articles cost the library money, it still eliminated cost for students. So we do totally accept that for these OER grants, um, as well as she used e-reserves, book chapters, some films. We worked together, her and I, I was her, I'm her librarian. And then she also created an open pedagogy assignment using Timeline JS, which is an open source tool and had students create timelines about um, female identifying coaches. So here's one on Pat Summit, right? Just a screenshot of it where you can see they have a timeline of uh, her first coaching job and then so on and so on throughout her career. So again, I just think it's a cool idea. And sometimes that's a question I get about these OER mini grants. Like, can you give an example? And now Miranda's gonna talk. Yeah, I'm happy to. So um, what you see now is a screenshot of the website that I wanted to share with you all as an example of OER content that can be developed um, sort of as a content module in a course, as opposed to replacing an entire textbook. So like I said, this website was developed in partnership with some faculty members of HDF and SES. Um, and those, if you're not familiar with those programs, I'll read you the entire very long description of these programs. So bear with me. So this was developed for a resource for students enrolled in the birth through kindergarten teacher licensure program and the early care and education programs in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies and the Department of Specialized Education Services. So obviously that would not all fit 
on the banner of their website, which is why we called it the HDF SES OER modules. And these were developed as a resource for both faculty and for students. So the process that we followed was that I was the project manager for this project. And these faculty members partnered with my department, UNCG Online, to create this resource as um, not necessarily a textbook replacement, but something that faculty members across these programs could use with their students instead of um, maybe purchasing a textbook possibly or um, spending money on some other sort of resource. These are content modules meant to be used openly across the program and content can be copied and pasted, integrated into a Canvas course, whatever it might be. So first I will just sort of explain the process that we approach this with in case anyone is a faculty member and thinking about maybe partnering with some colleagues to create something similar for their programs. So what we did was we followed the backwards design process and so we started out with thinking about learning outcomes. So what is really the purpose of this site? Um, and Sam, I think you can go to the next slide if that's okay, please. Thank you. Um, so we thought about what would um, a good start, a learning outcome be for faculty members. And we realized that we really wanted faculty across these programs to be able to leverage these modules as supplemental course resources to provide consistency in language and terminology across topics in various courses. And then for students, we knew that they wanted um, the students to be able to utilize the modules to identify and refresh some foundational knowledge and then apply this content during hands on learning experiences like their student teaching and their practicum courses. So these SLOs helped give us a really clear guide of how we wanted to create this content. So the site um, was something that we thought would be a great fit for OER because these faculty members came with their own experiences, their own expertise, and a lot of the content that they wanted to write about was applicable across multiple specialties in the HDF and the SES fields. So I acted as the project manager for the group. Um, and whether you worked with UNCG online for a project like this or did it independently, it was really great, I think, to have sort of one point of contact to help coordinate these efforts. So we met as a group and then we met um, individually to work on the different modules. And faculty members were really the, um, the expertise voices here. I just helped compile this and put it into what you see as a WordPress website. So we had other faculty members work on um, reviewing the site, making sure the content was applicable across programs um, and courses that freshmen were taking versus juniors and seniors. And we also um, had faculty members review the site to make sure we didn't have typos or something was too um, specific to a certain time or date or something like that, because the purpose was to make this website kind of timeless. So it can be used now, it can be used next year. It's really just an ongoing living resource, which is great. So now I can go over some of the key elements of this site. So we can switch on to the next slide, which kind of describes this process. The site focuses on key concepts, best practices, and resources. And the modules can be used in any order. So it's not necessary for a student to review every single page of this website. It's really meant for faculty members to link out to a specific page if they need students to review this content or do something with it. Use it to prepare them to complete an assessment, for example. And actually that brings me to my next point, which is that no assessments are integrated into this content. So instructors have full control of how they want to direct students to these modules and whether or not they want to tie some of this OER content into course specific assessments. So the website content is open and it's ready for them to use however they need. And also there's no data tracking. So an instructor cannot see which students interacted with the site for how long, et cetera. And that wasn't really the purpose of the site. Just like if you had students purchase an expensive textbook, you wouldn't know how long they spent on each chapter. This really is just supposed to be a resource. And like I mentioned, it was designed in WordPress. Um, you could obviously build something like this in a Google site, site or in a Canvas org or something like that. But we chose WordPress because our department has resources that help sort of bring that type of website to life. And then instructors within HDF and SES can link to this website within their Canvas courses. So something that's a little bit ironic about this site currently is that it is currently locked and accessible only by UNCG login. And that's because the faculty members, it was their first time creating an OER website and they weren't 100% prepared to publish it and have it available to anyone on the web in the world. They wanted to be able to have it launched for a semester or two, see what was working, 
what wasn't working, get feedback from colleagues and from students. And then the idea is to publish it widely and available so anybody across the web could use it across other HDF, SES, you know, other institutions, really anybody but wanted to use it, but they're not quite there yet. So what I would love to do is go on to the next slide to show you a few screenshots of what the site looks like. So this is an example of the homepage. It shows you the different modules. They were organized by topic, not by a specific course within these programs or majors or anything like that. These are topics that are applicable across multiple different courses and programs within these departments. So professionalism and professional behavior, ethics, assessment, ed, TPA. And then there's a section for more information referencing back to the HDF SES websites and then any other resources or helpful links that faculty would wanna include there. So the next couple of slides, they all just show a screenshot of each of the module homepages. So this gives you an example of how the content is organized. So you can see there's an introduction, some key concepts, like for example, in this module, professionalism, key standards, dispositions. And so instructors who are utilizing this OER content, they can link students directly to a page within this module if they wanted to. So if they wanted students to review just content around, you know, dispositions, for example, they could do that. And then the instructor within their course could say, here's this content, now complete this assignment based on it, or refer to the entire ethics module for reference before we dive into whatever their course content might be. So the next couple of slides, again, they just show those module homepages, ethics, and then the next one, assessment, and then finally we have edTPA. And so if you have any questions about this site or wanna see any other pages, I could always share my screen and click through for you, but you get kind of the idea. It's really just a platform to be able to add written content, link out to videos, external resources, and then instructors who are accessing the site can remix that material how they need to. And so here again, contact information for UNCG online. If you had any questions about this or possibly wanted to pursue a project like this, you could always reach out to myself or our senior director, Chris Dunst, our dean, Dr. Karen Bull, and um, see if we have an opportunity to work with you all on that. And that's me. Thanks, Sam. So that is it in terms of our presentation. Um, but please let us know if you have any um, questions about OER at UNCG, the OER mini grants, um, working with UNCG online on a project like this or other projects. Um, please, this is a great time to ask. We have more time. And if a question comes to you later, you're always welcome to email me after the fact. Sometimes, you know, I'm in a webinar and I think, oh, I should have asked this five minutes after it's over. So any emails I'm open to. Yes, I feel like um, my kids' TVs are um, so loud. Uh, Sarah, yeah, I um, emailed, the, you registered, you were there yesterday, right? Um, so yesterday, in case uh, y'all weren't there, we talked about open pedagogy in EDI. Um, so connecting OER, open pedagogy, and um, EDI to that. So I will add it to that OER mini grants page, um, as well as the OER page. Um, this morning, I added it to our um, webinars page. Um, but let me actually, um, while we're here, um, find it. But y'all can ask other questions too. Sorry, I, I use um, Internet Explorer to be logged in to the uh, library account. <laughs> so that's why I went to Internet Explorer. Oh, sorry. Ooh, ooh. I don't know if y'all even heard that. I don't think I turned my audio on for that, but here we go. And so Melody um, spoke about open pedagogy in that and I thought it was great. Yeah. So um, it was kind of a weird timeline, you know, we did this um, second, right, a more intro to OER and then kind of this like, oh, you're interested in using ODR, OER, here's how to kind of push it further um, beyond uh, going even beyond replacing a textbook, which is of course great, um, and using it uh, to better, to have your student create open content. That's really what open pedagogy is in a way. I feel like my kids' TV is super loud. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it's not as loud for y'all. Um, so are there any questions about the grant? Is anyone interested in applying? Hopefully, I know there's um, some library liaisons here. 
if any of them have uh, stories about it or ideas. Um, our liaisons really are the people doing all the work. Uh, we just, uh, Melody and I just, you know, read over the applications and uh, help give out the money. So uh, if there's any questions about that, again, or stories or anything like that, let me know. Okay, well, I'm going to take your silence as um, either Miranda and I did such a great job, you have no questions, or you're tired. <laughs> Maybe a combo of both, um, you know, in this uh, December world we live in. Yes, we all tired. Um, so uh, definitely apply. Let us know if you have any questions, even if you, another question sometimes I get about the grants is that even if you've applied in the past and gotten it, you can get a second one. Um, so uh, keep that in mind as well, as well as um, if you have a department meeting, um, we, again, we particularly want to let um, every, A, we want to let everyone know about this to so help us market this, um, but you know, new faculty as well. Um, again, it, it's not just, again, tenure track faculty, if you know of, um, adjuncts or graduate students who are teaching and have a great idea for this, um, they can apply as well. Uh, there's plenty of time in March, come to the workshops. Um, and if you have any questions about UNCG online, like Miranda said, uh, please email her or go to that website. Um, again, they do a great job with online design, um, online courses, which again, um, I don't know about y'all, but I will still be mostly online in the spring. Um, the library will be doing our instruction online. Um, in the spring. So let us know if you have any questions. So I will um, stop sharing and let us all go. But thank you for coming. Have a great week. It's, it's only Tuesday. Um, and uh, I'll turn my camera back on. I don't think I have any kids running around the background. And um, yeah, great. I'll let you all go. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Um, have a great week. See you all virtually soon. Bye.